find more pleasure and more satisfaction in every area of your life with Davey Ward. Hey everybody, welcome to Sex is Medicine, your number one resource for holistic sex education and learning to use pleasure and sexual pleasure particularly as a form of medicine and healing to realize our ultimate human potential. I am your host, Miss Davy Ward Erickson, broadcasting live from Kelowna, British Columbia in our new amazing, wonderful home. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to check out Kelowna, British Columbia, or Lake Okanagan, I highly recommend you do. It's uh, beautiful, beautiful views. You can go to my Instagram page, Davy Ward Tantra, and check out some of the views from our balcony um, and learn more about Lake Okanagan with the Okapogo, giant serpent <laughs> spirit who lives here that we make offerings to. <laughs> <laughs> This evening, we are going to uh, be talking about sex work as a healing art. And I have my amazing, wonderful friend, Miss Carmen Shakti, who is a sex worker and an activist to, um, to help us understand um, what that means, sex work as a healing art, the roots of sex work, um, and then some of the challenges that sex workers face in today's society um, the criminalization, the persecution, all of that stuff, and like why that's happening. Like, why is it not okay for consenting adults, consenting adults to do whatever the fuck they want to do? Right? <laughs> In their bedrooms. <laughs> why is that not okay? Why is that not okay? So we're going to talk about all of that and, and the historical roots of, of, of policing human sexuality. It's a big deal. So without further ado, Carmen Shakti, beautiful. Um, may you, would you please be willing to introduce yourself? And I'm going to put you on speaker view so everyone can see your gorgeous face. Okay. <laughs> Hi. So I'm Carmen, and I've been working as a sex worker for about eight years now. And I, um, I practice a melding of, of um, tantra and shamanistic healing and um, escort work, massage, and a little bit of kinky stuff. And the orientation is, is very healing. And um, I'm also an author, a writer. I have a chapter in a book. And I, in the abundance factor, sorry, I'm kind of not really good at introducing myself. I... <laughs> And um, yeah, so I, I was in the Hooker Monologues a few years ago, which was a, a play that a group of sex workers got together to, to um, write our stories and shine light on what really happens and dispel some of the myths and stigma. And that, that's a big part of my activism is just saying, hey, this is what it actually is about. And this should not be criminalized because criminalization just makes it harder and more dangerous and we don't need that. Yeah. And, and you also, so I just want to mention about the hooker monologues, like that was a hit show. Like we try to get tickets for that. <laughs> like usually like my day, usual Davy thing, like, Oh, we'll go a week before. Right. <laughs> Holy sold out. You guys, like you had to add shows. So yeah, we did. if you ever get an opportunity and that was in Vancouver, British Columbia. So if you guys, if you ever get an opportunity to see the hooker monologues, it is a phenomenal show from what I hear. <laughs> it was sold out. So <laughs> <laughs> there's a CBC document documentary that's on YouTube from the National, so you can look for that. What is that again? Say that again, please. Oh, sorry about the, the Hooker monologues. The CBC, the National, did a, a documentary about Hooker monologues, which is on YouTube. That is awesome. I had no idea. Okay, so look that up. Hooker monologues, CBC International. That's amazing. That's phenomenal. Yeah. So, so... Let's talk about you being a sex worker. You're a sex I think of you as a sex worker activist, sex worker, and I, like they kind of go hand in hand. Like it's, it's they do. Kinda, in this day and age, kind of hard to do one without the other, right? That's true. Um, and so, when did you get into what you define as sex work? When did that start for you? Well, I mean, I am. Um, I started officially when I was 27, and I was kind of I was leaving a. Uh, an abusive marriage and kind of trying to find myself 
but before that I'd, I'd visited a, a sexological body worker as a client. So I started out on the other side of the fence and I was you know, terrified. And the first time we didn't even take the sheet off of me and I just sobbed the entire session. And then the next time I saw him, I was way more prepared to actually play and it was a beautiful experience. And so I, I'd been thinking about that and thinking, I really want to be able to guide other people through these experiences and help them heal sexual trauma and become more empowered and all of this. But I still had a lot of conditioning about monogamy and being the, the, you know, right way to be for everyone. And, um, and I didn't see how I could do it until I ended up in a situation where I was in Vancouver, newly divorced, alone, and I didn't have any money. And I was you know, trying to make it in, in diner jobs and what have you. And then I thought, you know, why not just become an escort and then save some money, take some training, which I did with the lovely Davy. <laughs> And here I am nine years later. So you made a conscious choice to go into sex work as a way to meet financial needs. And then so when you entered into the field, like you're still in it, however many years later. Mm -hmm. so, so what did you find when you entered in the field? Like what, obviously you enjoy it. Yeah. So, so, so what is it that you enjoy and, and, and was that a surprise to you? It was and it wasn't because I've, I've always been very pro um, sex workers rights and know that the work should be as safe as possible. But before I became a sex worker myself, I had certain, I guess, judgments about the kind of men that would see sex workers. So I was terrified. I was just like, what am I doing to myself? But I can't live in poverty anymore so so that was that was a scary thing but then when I, I got into it and and I, they were so kind and lovely for the most part and there were really beautiful moments of connection even even though I, I didn't start in the best place it was a an agency that did out calls so I'd work all night traveling around the city with the driver and a lot of a lot of drugs, a lot of late nights, and the, the clients were using drugs. I, I didn't really go there. But there was also men who just wanted to connect, and just a lot of them were, um, were grieving, actually, o older men grieving their, the death of their wives. And I saw one, one client for about a year, and he was in his 80s and his wife had recently passed away and he loved her so much and he just basically just liked to cuddle naked on the couch and tell me stories about his wife and it was beautiful and I felt like I was really making a difference in in his life because he was lonely and he was grieving and brought him a little bit of happiness yeah. Wow. Like I, I've got tears coming to my eyes because I'm just thinking of like how essential that is for yeah. humanity, for, yeah. for a person like that to have that, have a space for that to occur, for that, for that, that connection and that healing to occur and, and how precious it is. Um, to have people such as yourself who are able and willing to provide that type of um, love, that type of connection, that type of counsel um, to to other human beings, and and in that particular way, and and so I, I want to talk because we really want to focus on 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 the healing aspect of sex work. So you are one of the things I love about you is is um, how well how intelligent you are and how knowledgeable you are and how well read you are. And so one of the things we've had discussions about like the roots of of sex work um, or the historical kind of mm orientation to to sex work what it used to be historically versus what it is now so in your understanding like what are some of the 
thousands and thousands of years ago, was there a time? What's yes. fun time? <laughs> <laughs> What's fun time? Where, like, where like, you, like, human beings could, could connect sexually and offer sexual services without being demonized. Yeah, exactly. And um, the, first, the first example that comes to mind is ancient Babylon and Sumer. And they had different, different um, classes of sex workers, and they were all respected. They, they went from the highest ones were the, the temple priestesses who would um, basically their, their sex work was an offering to the gods and it was a very sacred experience. And, and a lot of what they would do is they'd, when men came back from war, they'd go to the temple and be healed in these experiences with these priestesses. and. And then they had other workers that were kind of more maybe like the equivalent of the blue collar sex workers who were in the taverns, but they were business women, they were respected. And the, um, the temple priestesses, what I think is super cool is that they had a lot of influence in the government. So they were in, in, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, they talk about the horror of Babylon. That was the, the goddess Inanna who was you know, the, um, the mother of harlots and, um, all the, she was basically the original sacred sex worker in Babylonian mythology. And so there was a really beautiful matriarchal kind of culture around sex work there. So I want to point out and just interject something. So pointing, cause I found this fascinating. So when the, when the soldiers came back from war, the mm -hmm. first thing they would do is go to the temple and get loved on by these priestesses. So yeah. talk about healing PTSD. I yeah. bet they didn't then want to go pick up an AK-47 or with an AR-15 or whatever the hell it was and go shoot up a church. Exactly. Get your PTSD from war addressed through sexual healing. Exactly. That's and that's why in um, you look at societies today, the ones that are most sexually repressed are more violent than the ones that are sexually liberated. Exactly. In fact, we had a social scientist on our show several years ago, Dr. Ron Goldman, who said exactly that, that the most sexually, the most violent societies are also the most sexually repressed. Mm -hmm. Again, speaks to the fact that pleasure is literally medicine for healing. So, so that was, that was ancient Babylon and, and there are other examples on the planet of times when it seems as though they were traditions, either a uh, matriarchal society, which doesn't mean that women were higher. Matriarchal societies, from my understanding, were typically egalitarian. Yes. Right? Exactly. They weren't, they, it's not like patriarchy today. Patriarchy is like, we, fuck you. Like we rule. It's, but matriarchal societies traditionally that it wasn't a power dynamic. It was more egalitarian. Exactly. Like the early leaders, um, the, in, in egalitarian matriarchal societies kind of, it seems like they related to their, their people, their subjects as like with the care that a mother would have for her child rather than, squashing the the plebs yes exactly exactly so so that so there was just wanting to prevent everyone's mind there is an imprint of consciousness on this planet in which like people who offered sexual or healing through their bodies that included their genitals <laughs> that that was celebrated and respected and honored so that is a blueprint in the mass consciousness on this planet mm -hmm. so let's fast forward to today it's mm -hmm. not like that and in fact, I say this often on the show, this is what kills me, Carbon, is that, okay, so in the United States, sex work, meaning exchanging sex for money or sexual touch, like, or like looking at someone's genitals, anything having to do with genitals and money is, and exchange of money is, is illegal, at least yeah. in, America, in many other places in the world, except for if you film it. Yeah, how does that make any sense? <laughs> I don't understand that. I don't understand how people like allow this shit to continue. So in Canada, which is where you are right now, what are the laws around around uh, sex workers? Well, currently the laws we had, um, and 
yeah, well, maybe I'll, I'll just go back and I'll tell you the, the way that the, the law has changed. Okay. Because first we had basically sex work was legal, but everything around it was illegal. So you couldn't work with anyone. You couldn't work out of your home. You couldn't um, hire a driver. You couldn't hire a receptionist. You couldn't hire security without it being break of the law. You couldn't be on your cell phone, in your car, discussing sex work because that's um, in a public place communicating. So this group of sex workers and activists challenged the law and they took it right to the Supreme Court and got the law struck down because it was unconstitutional, violated sex workers' right to life, liberty, security of the person. But unfortunately, this happened in 2014 in the era of Stephen Harper and um, I call him the former Injustice Minister Peter McKay. And he had hang-ups about sex and thought that instead of treating us as scarlet whores and criminals that he'd treat us like, you know, dumb children, victims who don't really know what we're doing. So they replaced the old laws with the new laws, which basically says it's okay for me to sell sex, sexual services, but if you buy those services, you're breaking the law. So that drives the industry underground. It reproduces the harms of the old law, but it appeased some of the some of the more conservative people who who think that they know better about our workplaces than we do. And in saying, well, we're not criminalizing the the poor, degraded prostitutes. We're just um we're trying to end demand, so essentially taking our livelihood away and denying a trying to deny a wonderful service to people who need it. So Why do you think that is? Um, Why? It's very strange, and I, I try to figure that out every day, but it's it just seems like there's a disconnect in, in the government between what sex workers have been telling them about our lives for years, for decades, and what they actually believe. And there's a lot of, even in, in you know, radical feminism and the Christian right, they have this, I call it the ungodly alliance of, of these two ideologies where they both intersect on hating on sex workers. And they treat us like we're either completely disempowered victims who can't consent. And you see, hear a lot of feminists like Ashley Judd. I, I'm going to have to have a talk with her one day of saying that well, cash is proof of coercion and there's no way that you can, you know, monetize women's orifices. And it, it's, they, um, they talk about us in such um, objectifying, dehumanizing language, like we sell our bodies. We don't sell our bodies. We sell a skilled service. It's our labor. Would you say a waitress sells her body? No, you don't say that. You don't say a massage therapist sells her body. They all work with their bodies. So why is it different for us? But it's... Because sexy. vaginas. Yeah. Because vaginas. Because, because vaginas are involved and vaginas <laughs> must be regulated. Vaginas yeah. are not free. They, we don't own our vaginas. They belong no. to the government. Exactly. <laughs> so, so uh, the other thing about, about sex work, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of stigma and, and, and if you're just tuning in, I just want to, you know, invite you again or welcome you again to Sex is Medicine, David Ward Erickson. I'm here with my, my beautiful uh, friend uh, and colleague Carmen Shakti talking about sex work as a healing art. And so before, <laughs> before, I don't know, years ago, before now, um, I, I had similar views around, around uh, sex work, a belief that, that it was um, less than that people, particularly women, because it is a female dominated profession, right? Like nursing and school teaching and typically female dominated professions tend to 
you know, not be as worthy or valuable. Yeah. Um, but particularly, in, and, and if your vagina is involved, even more so. <laughs> um, but I, but I, had, I had beliefs um, around it being um, something lesser or lower. Mm. And, you know, and, and through the years, um, examining these, these belief systems and having, and having them confronted directly by, by being friends with you, but then also, you know, being in the industry of, of sex education and, and Tantra um, and encountering other people, empowered sex workers, right? Because that's not something we think of in mainstream. No. We think the, 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 the father we're fed is the, the victimization and you know, traumatic childhood and you're on the streets and you don't have another option and you got the pimp. So like the human trafficking vision yeah. is basically what we are, are spoon fed. And that's what, that's what, you know, in, in whatever feeds our, our, our concept of it. But until I was friends with you and, and met and, and other empowered sex workers who it was, it was it, your choice to do this mm -hmm. and, and got to see the, 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 the other side of this, that, that it isn't, and it, you know, reminded me very much of when I was, when I was a stripper, mm -hmm. which, is a form of sex work. Yeah. Really. I didn't know that. I didn't hear on the Fourier key than, than escorting, but it is. Yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> but it reminded me a lot of, of when I was a stripper and how often it was just, it was the companionship mm -hmm. that the gentlemen were wanting. So they were wanting, you know, they wanted to sit and talk. <laughs> and then they wanted maybe a you know like a lap dance or a table dance or something like that so they were wanting some physical connection and and those were the those were like the regulars the, the people that would come often is those they were seeking connection that like the frat boy parties and the abuse and that kind of stuff that happened uh, occasionally but it was like you know balance like 80 percent people seeking connection and 20 percent people looking to like be frat boys right and yeah and, MFs, right? Exactly. So, so in your work, what is it that you, that you see? Like, what is it that keeps you wanting to do this? Like, what are some of the experiences that you have in this industry that can help us as a culture shift our understanding of what sex work actually is? Because we don't, we don't fucking get it. No, <laughs> no, we don't. And, um, well, let's see. I, um, I had an experience I believe it was someone you referred to me and um and he'd basically he was in his 30s and he hadn't lost his virginity and it had become this this big thing like that it became a, a big scary obstacle and the longer that you put it off the the more fraud it becomes so i met him for coffee and we had a a lovely kind of like a first date experience and walked around and came back to my place and I gave him an excellent first time experience. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's amazing. So he was able to have his first sexual experience with, a, with someone who was skilled and mm -hmm. could help him navigate that. And he didn't have to worry about, you know, relationship difficulties and all that kind of awkwardness that can happen. Yeah. And able to walk him through and guide him to having a satisfactory experience. Yeah, exactly. And it was it was a lot of fun. It was fun for me. It was fun for him. He I um I was in touch with someone. I actually got a few referrals from he, he has a, a men's group that he's part of and there's and the the leader of the men's group kept calling me and saying, you know, I can't believe how how much of a difference I see in in my friend said he's had he's so much more confident he's he's getting out there he's going after his dreams and and then he sent a few other gentlemen from his men's group to see me and that was always lovely one of them was getting over a, a relationship breakup and he just just wanted someone to talk to really talk to and cuddle and some sex play happened but he said he didn't really want to have you know, sex with someone that he didn't have a long-term kind of emotional connection with. So it was just, but he said it helped him get over the breakup. And yeah, so there are situations like that that are kind of more, more common in, 
in my experience than the than the kind of stereotypical rude clients it's like there's this mythology in in our society that that says that clients of sex workers don't treat us with respect but most people don't they don't want to be mean to someone that they're having a sexual experience with i mean why would you do that uh, can- yeah that's kind of that's a for that's like that's psychosis. That's not normal, right? No, exactly. Yeah, exactly. If you've got to put your cock in my mouth, you better be nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and, and that, that's one of the things that, like, I, I've been very, again, struck by because on the outside looking in, like, we, you don't know what you don't know, and you don't know it until you're part of the industry but Mm -hmm. something that i've been very struck by like hearing you you share about your experiences with with your clients and then hearing you you know interact with them when i've been in the environment and you know and no names just one any of her clients listening no name i don't know who you are (laughs) (laughs) no (laughs) but but something that's really that i've that's really stood out for me is um just like the kindness Mm -hmm. and passion and the mutual respect um, that that you and your clients have for one another, and again, this really critical, crucial service that you are providing by being willing to just be present and open-hearted and and non-judgmental. That's something that really, really has stood out for me in in your specific, you know, your your personality in general. Uh, and and be and doing this work is like just like the non-judgmental space you you hold or allow for people to explore different aspects of their sexuality that they're not even comfortable with themselves but because you reflect back to them that that non-judgmental space they learn to become comfortable with it Mm -hmm. yeah that's a really beautiful thing so what are some of the personality traits that you believe are important for um, being a, a, a skilled sex worker? Hmm. Like a sex well, worker who's also a healer. Sorry to interrupt yeah. you. Because, because that's really like what, what I observe. Like people may not define it. But, and I'm not just talking about you. Like reading other people on my timeline on Twitter. And just like, like sex workers who, are, who I have witnessed, had an opportunity to witness, and, and are very vocal there's there like it just comes through like this is a healing art like this is a this is a valuable necessary service that's being provided and there seems to be a certain quality of human that is particularly designed to be able to offer this service to others so what are some of those qualities that you feel are important for a for a a a sex worker slash healer hmm well i think um you you said a lot of them just before about being compassionate, being accepting, non-judgmental, creating a space that's safe and that also allows them to feel free to go to those places that they want to go to and explore and play and you know, being someone who really enjoys sex helps. It mm. certainly doesn't hurt. I've been told I have the libido of 10 gay men, so there's that. (laughs) Yeah, if you really don't enjoy sex, it's probably not the field for you. No, and I mean, I do know sex workers who are asexual and and don't have sex in their private lives, but they, they can, you know, curate this experience for people. But I think that there's something about really loving what you're doing and being able to connect in a beautiful, authentic way. Like I hear a lot of times when people talk about sex work, they say you have to be a good actor. I don't feel that I act most of the time. I'm basically like the best version of me when I'm at work. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind, I'm patient, I'm friendly and bubbly and, and um, able to communicate with, my clients about what they need and and help them feel at ease and basically a lot of the same traits that a a counselor would have and and then I just I I remember when I first started applying to agencies when I was just starting out and I 
I talked to one of the receptionists at one of the agencies that I was interviewed at, and she said her piece of advice was find something to love in every client and focus on that. And that's what I do. I um, And it's often a lot of things to love because I, I tend to attract really kind and, and um, lovely people who are interested in spiritual growth and personal development. So I've had some clients that have become friends and some that have just, I, I feel really connected to, and I really wish them well always. And yeah, so that's, and also, you know, you need a certain amount of organizational skills. You need to be able to set up a nice space and post ads and answer your phone and show up on time properly, you know, prepared. So all of, all of those things. So that really busts the myth, like you said, that it's you have to be a good actor and that it's just this like business transition, it's transaction. Mm -hmm. You're actually connecting with the humanity of these people Mm -hmm. and and like wanting their well-being and they they often want yours at the same time. And and I've heard you say that it's it's similar to to counseling except vagina. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And it's funny, like in this culture, as soon as your genitals are involved, as soon as your vagina is involved, particularly, you, um, it's like any intelligence or skill or, or any other redeeming qualities that you have just go out the window and you're just, you're just a, someone you can, they can write off. Unless you're, unless you're vagina, you're giving your vagina to who the government says you can give your vagina. Yeah. <laughs> husband and no one else context that you can give your vagina only in that way yeah in that way yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) so that's really beautiful and and you know that the connection is what makes it medicine Mm -hmm, exactly right because sex without connection is not medicine you know and connection can look all different ways i'm not saying that connection for those you know that are into different sexual expressions like connection doesn't always have to look like oh i'm in love and i want to marry you obviously because here we are talking about sex work yeah but most people have agreed that regardless of how you are expressing your sexuality or your sensuality when there is connection that's when it's sublime because we are mm-hmm. wired as human beings for connection exactly. that's what we're wired for. That's that's we, that we are and that's the thing i'm sorry to no go in there but um like that was a, a thing that surprised me at first because I'd, I'd had such a, you know, an idea of the kind of men who go to see sex workers. And then these guys are wanting to connect with me and they'd often bring flowers, little gifts, thank you cards. Like they really love to treat us well. And, and it's, it's beautiful. And they, they want, to connect with us and make us feel comfortable and and a lot of them will ask me like what do you like to do I want to do something for you so even though it's a sexual experience that I'm I'm tailoring for them that's if if it's something that's maybe not my favorite thing in the world to do but I'm happy to do it and it's their favorite thing then that's what we'll do but a lot of them they just really want to please me in all these ways. And it's really lovely. So what type of, like, what are kind of this, the, the circumstances that, that men come to see you? Like, uh, like who are they? And I mean, not their names or anything like that, but <laughs> yeah. is a picture of the different types of men. Like you mentioned the 80 year old man whose wife had just died and he just wanted like to snuggle and talk. Right. Yeah. So, so what are some of the other men who, who come to see you? What are they looking for? What are they, yeah. what are they needing? There's um, a very wide range of, of men. And, and it's not just men. There's women that come and see me too, which is always a nice treat. But... There's <laughs> <laughs> vaginas! Yeah. <laughs> There's a little aside. I, um, I did not know when I got into this industry that I would be paid to have sexual experiences with all these beautiful women. So as a bi girl, that's kind of my dream. So, but 
Congratulations! Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> like, if I'd known that, I would have gone in on my 19th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, the, the bonuses just keep coming. Yes. <laughs> and I mean, a lot of them are, um, probably most of them are um, businessmen who are just too busy to date and they want to have experiences. They want to explore their sexuality and they have money. And so they, they kind of want like a, a girlfriend without the, um, the full time commitment. And that's a common one. And then people who are in marriages where they don't have a sexual connection or a emotional connection anymore. That's another common, common type. And I had, I've had like, from early twenties all the way up to 80 years old. And one of the younger men who saw me just remembered he saw me for a really long session at his hotel and he just lost both of his parents. So he'd, he was traveling around feeling really lost and alone and in mourning. And, and he said, like, I, I came into his hotel room and, and he said, I just want to cuddle. And I said, do you want me to get naked first? And he said, oh no, that makes me uneasy. Can we just cuddle with clothes on? So I did. And I was there for eight hours, I think. And all night we just talked. I told him jokes. He told me about his parents and it was lovely. It was so beautiful. At the end, I, I got him naked, but. For <laughs> Carmen. <laughs> And sometimes it feels that way, like like when I'm, because a lot of times I'll come to work and I'll I'll be in the mood for sex, and I'll and then they just want to talk, and I'm just like, but but, <laughs> but of course it's it's their time, so <laughs> what's a girl to do? <laughs> yeah, I'm like I used to joke like, what's a girl got to do to get laid in this city? Like even charging for it doesn't always work. <laughs> But, but again, that, that's such a, you know, that's a, such a reframe because the stereotypical mainstream view, oh man, just, you know, whatever, they just want to fuck and blah, 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 and they don't care just to stick a hole in it, right? Yeah. But what I've learned in, in my industry, teaching, you know, holistic healing, tantra, sexual healing, is is that that there are so many men that again are they connection you're mm -hmm. like and this the society cripples the emotional expression of men and so they don't or lingam owners people who are cisgender men and so they don't necessarily have the outlets the societal outlets to express themselves so they need they need to you need to find it somewhere otherwise you're going to grab a gun and start shooting people absolutely and that's a great point because that was another thing that I, I noticed as a sex worker was that, and I, I started thinking because it's, it's very accepted for men to seek out sexual experiences. So hiring a sex worker for the evening, well, that's, that's masculine. And I'd, I'd get a lot of, when I was an, an agency girl, I'd get a lot of these calls where it's two, two or three escorts going to a house with a couple of guys and we'd, kind of pair off and and they'd often make a lot of bravado like oh we're gonna fuck and we're gonna do this and that and then we'd get into the room and they'd be like can you just hold me yeah <laughs> and a lot of yeah. and some of them times they'd cry and it was like that was the only safe space they could cry in front of another person and be accepted and loved as they are and so it's it actually um it deepened my love and compassion for men being a sex worker because it just I started to realize just how much shame men carry because I, I used to think as a I've always been very sexually expressive and I was slut shamed a lot in my earlier years so I had kind of a resentment like you know men have it so easy they can go and have all the sex they want but then I'd, I'd come to work and there'd be 
another common experience was a guy who couldn't get an erection in a session and he'd be terribly ashamed and it was even even in an experience he was paying for he felt the pressure to perform and i'd just say does this feel good what i'm doing to you and he'd say yes and i'd say then we're having a, a successful sexual encounter enjoy mm -hmm. and you just see the um the weight lift they just be like thank god i don't have to worry about performance and holding my feelings in and being strong and being invulnerable all the time because that that's exhausting who wants to live like that oh, yeah it's like a, a safe haven and 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 the thing that i've also heard is that oftentimes these these men can't even do this in their marriages or their relationships right because there's you know there's there's a, there's a lot of dysfunctional marriages there <laughs> oh, yeah that's why i make the big bucks <laughs> yeah there's a there's a lot of a lot of pain and there's a lot of reasons that people choose to stay in marriages that are not you know that maybe are sexless or maybe don't make their heart sing because they it's meeting other needs or they're meeting other needs in the circumstance so True. so that's why they choose to stay there so and yet the core human need these again these are biologically based needs people these aren't like mm -hmm. oh i wish i fantasize it's a biologically based need you have to eat you have to drink you have to shit <laughs> yeah. and, and 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 sexual expression whether that is you know having sex with people or not however that looks for you but mm -hmm. sexual expression is a need and human connection is a need we will die without it and in like mm -hmm. tribal days if you you did something bad and they kicked you out of the tribe you died exactly <laughs> you die yeah. without the connection so 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 we live in in a society that's very fragmented and mm -hmm. very isolated and oftentimes like you're describing these these humans these men have nowhere else to go and so having this haven of of women and men who choose to devote their lives to providing connection yeah that's what you're doing you yeah devoted your life to providing connection and sometimes that includes your vagina yes it does <laughs> and i i have a vagina and a brain and i can use them both <laughs> <laughs> So that, that is just, that's, it's just powerful and necessary and vital. And mm -hmm. why is it criminalized? That's, I, I, I want to like scream about it. Let's scream yeah. about it. Like I want the audience to think about it. Like why is the, the type of experience that, that Carmen is describing, why is that against the law? Why is it against the law to snuggle naked with another human being? Yeah. Why is it against the law to, you know, show up and like allow someone to cry in your arms? Why is it against the law to massage them or give them pleasure? Yeah. Or why is that against the law? Like, that's yeah. what I want us all to question. And who is telling us that it's against the law? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, one of the things that I've noticed in politicians talking about sex work, because the, um, well, the sex workers rights activists or the pimp lobby, as the radical feminists call us. I really wish they wouldn't do that, but they um, they have this idea that we're either just victims or we're agents of the patriarchy and we're, we're just terrible. And then I hear these even left-wing politicians, they, they like to say, oh, um, the issue of sex work is very complicated. And I'm like, it's not complicated. I want my human rights. I want my labor rights. I want to be able to rent an apartment, see clients there, not risk eviction, not risk you know, being killed because clients are too afraid to give me their screening information. I want to be safe. And decriminalization is the only model that actually creates the optimal working environment for sex workers and that model only exists in new zealand and unfortunately you can't migrate to new zealand for the purpose of sex work because that's they they still had some weird hang-ups about the trafficking even though the um the actual 
majority of trafficked labor in the world is farm labor. It's not sex work. Sex, sex trafficking happens. It's not as prevalent as they say it is. They conflate the um, consensual sex work with trafficking. If I post an ad on, say, Leo List or some place, I'm trafficking myself. So it's very misleading. And they, they try to make it sound way more oppressive than it is. And I, I believe it's because they have profound hangups about sex. And that's the thing that I, I say a lot is people in my community are, you know, living without a lot of these basic protections that others, other people in this country have because people have hangups about sex. We're suffering because y'all fucked up about sex. Yeah. And- yeah fix your shit, you know? <laughs> exactly. So again, once again, this is like the running theme on the show. Once again, other people's sexual hangups are impeding our freedom of expression. Exactly. That should be against the law. Yeah, it should be. It's like you don't let, you don't agree with sex work. Fine. Don't see a sex worker. Don't be a sex worker. Leave us alone. Yeah. So that's a huge thing. So the basic human rights, the right, the right to work and not be persecuted the i don't know what what other <laughs> what what else did you say so the right to work without being persecuted the right for your clients to receive the services i mean this is the thing we're adults yeah right you are an adult your clients are adults if they were coming to you for a foot massage yeah it wouldn't be, be an issue yeah. but because there is vagina and penis involved there's a problem there. Yeah. So let's talk about the the new laws, the internet laws in the United States that have made your work even more dangerous. Yes, SESTA and FOSTA. They're terrible. They're they're supposedly to stop sex trafficking, but let's be honest, they just don't want us working. They 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 just want the industry criminalized. And the problem with SESTA and FOSTA is they go after internet platforms and a lot of the places where sex workers advertise are posted in the states so the like even google and backpage backpage was seized by the fbi and and um now eros which was another another escort advertising site they have cooperated with the feds and given up a lot of sex workers confidential information and so a lot of people a lot of workers are banned from the states now they're they're not allowed across the border because they've been flagged for like at least at least four or five people that i know have had this happen so every time i cross the border i'm praying that and i've i've been lucky i've been told i look very sweet and innocent so i get away with a lot but so maybe next time Trump leaves the country, he shouldn't be able to come back in because he is a sexual predator. Exactly. But that's okay. It's, you know, consenting adults exchanging money for a lovely connected sexual experience. We're the criminals, but a sexual predator like Trump, that's just business as usual. Which really shows the, the violence in the culture. Because wow, yeah. it's, I, and I read this thing and, and I find this so deeply disturbing that in movie ratings, a consensual sex scene that um, that's maybe explicit but consensual and lovely gets a more mature rating than a rape scene. So, yes, exactly. Because, yes, exactly, exactly. And I know so many sex educators. Uh, the same thing. The censorship is insane. We can't provide education about intimacy and connection and pleasure, but porn. Exactly. Yeah. And when I'm, when I'm trying to advertise now with SESTA and FOSTA, I'll, I'll write this gorgeous ad copy and then I'll put it online. And then they're like, Oh, you can't say that you said girlfriends that that could mean many different things. So I have to go and change all this wording. It takes such a long time. It's such a pain in the ass. I really, wish that they would just leave us alone and let us say sensual in our ads and let us say sex and let us, you know, just, just because it also 
it wastes a lot of our time. And, you know, if I can't say I provide these services and not these in my ad, because you can't have anything about sex, then I get all these calls, you know, about things that I don't offer and I have to talk. And, you know, if, if it was just in the ad, they'd know not to call me if they were looking for something different. So it's, it's just. So again, of- and again, it boils down to the criminalization of human sexuality and particularly vaginas. Yes. I'm just going to keep saying vagina. Just going to keep saying that word because it makes people's brains melt. Um, <laughs> but, but, but human sexuality in general, right? It's mm-hmm. the criminalization of human sexuality. That is, that is the root cause of, of all of this insanity that we see mm-hmm. showing up on the, the movie screen of our lives right now. Yes. So, so for you, I want to invite people who are listening to stay connected with you and for those who may like to work with you, how can, how can folks get a hold of you to learn more about you and your amazing work in the world? It's not just like sex work, activism, everything included. Um, how can they find you? Thank you. Well, um, my website is currently being redeveloped. I, I took some time off recently, so that's not up at the moment, but I am on Twitter, Carmen Shakti and on Twitter. So you can find me there. And then there's links. I'm, I'm also on Medium, it's Carmen Shakti. So you can find some articles and essays that I've written. I'm going to be writing a lot more in the near future. Good, because you're an excellent writer. And then Carmen Shakti has also written some articles for um, our website, AuthenticTantra.com, discussing this very issue um, and how sex work healed, helped uh, heal your heart towards, towards male-bodied beings. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Carmen Shakti is also the star in yeah. many of our um, sexual healing videos that we yeah. include in our Tantra training program. So she mm-hmm. uh, is beautifully, because Carmen Shakti is a, a well-trained Tantrika, as well as a shaman, as well as a Vajrayana Buddhist practitioner, accomplished lineage, refuge, all of that good stuff. So you're working with some power here. Um, and so graciously demonstrates many of the sexual healing methods that we teach so that people have a visual um, reference when they're going through the practices on their own. So thank mm-hmm. you so much for the amazing service that you offer all of us. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, it has been amazing spending time with you this evening, having a conversation online that we've had many times on the couch at home over glasses of red wine. <laughs> <laughs> We, there's there's even more cussing in those conversations. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I took it down a little bit <laughs> for the radio. Because <laughs> I'm a fucking lady. <laughs> so take, a few, take a few of the fucks out of there and replace them with vaginas. Yeah, vagina. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did learn from the best. <laughs> <laughs> About fucking or vaginas? <laughs> oh, I punch <laughs> Yeah, all of the above. (laughs) It's all connected. (laughs) And thank you everyone for joining us this evening. And and I really like what I really wanted to share with the show is to give you an inside view to hear from from Carmen Shakti herself, an empowered female human who chooses to to offer love through her body (laughs) under the umbrella of sex work um and hear what that's really about because that was a game changer for me that completely changed my my it it helped eat away and erode those cultural uh, misconceptions those myths those stigmas and helped me understand um, that this is a beautiful service that's being provided and 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 it's not you know the thing is is the reality is, is it's not for everybody like I was trying to point to, there's a certain disposition of human that, that is uniquely, it's like you're like molded and designed for that. And I'm guessing that like way back, you know, in the Babylonian Sumerian times, like that was understood. Like there were folks who were born sexual healers and, mm-hmm. and had a talent and a gift. Yeah. And because of sexuality being persecuted in society, you know, we're not able to recognize and cultivate that. Uh, within ourselves, uh, you know, when we become adults. So, yeah. So thank you all for joining us for this uh, conversation. I'm going to invite you to stay connected with us 
Carmen Shakti on Twitter, me on Instagram and Facebook. Those are my favorite uh, platforms to play on, Davey Ward Tantra. Also check us out at AuthenticTantra.com um, and Authentic Tantra on Instagram and Facebook. We have some amazing thoughts and content and readings and scriptures and all kinds of wonderful things about the intersection of sexuality, spirituality, our humanity, and personal growth. Mm. Uh, join us live next month. I don't know what the date is off the top of my head. We'll get a look on the calendar, October. Uh, we're going to have another fabulous live episode of Sex is Medicine. And in between shows, make sure you su subscribe to us on YouTube. Um, um, oh, it's uh, October 3rd. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> my husband's birthday. <laughs> Make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube, tune in, iTunes, all the good platforms, and keep us in your inbox. Uh, much love, many blessings. Have a fabulous, fabulous night, fabulous weekend, and yes, all that and more. <laughs> <laughs>